Live from the BDN Studios, it's Bang and Dang. That's awesome. If you don't like that, then you ain't black. Welcome back to Outlaws of Gunslingers Mafia Edition with Bang and Dang. Continuing on the old Bonanno family. And after last week's four-person uh, smorgasbord that was still only 20 minutes long. We uh, got a little bit longer one for you, but we still got two people. We got Carmine Galante and Anthony Spiro. Um, obviously, intern bosses or acting bosses. Then next week, we got a good one for you guys as Joseph Messino, who's got a nice little story. Uh, I think he was the longest boss of the family besides Bonanno. It was to like ni- or 2000-something from like 80s. But, uh, yeah, got some good stuff before we get to, oh, Joseph Pistone, Donnie Brasco, and move on to the next family, on to the next one. Starting off, Carmine Galante. He was acting boss, but unofficial of the Bonanno crime family. He was born February 21st, 1910 in a tenement building in East Harlem section of Manhattan. All right. His parents, Vincenzo James Galante and Vincenza Russo, nice. had immigrated from Castellomer del Golfo, Sicily. Vinny and Vinny. Vinny and Vinny. To, uh, they moved to New York City in 1906, where Vincenzo was a fisherman. Oh, that's nice. Good for him, right? Carmine Galante had two bros, Samuel and Peter. Two sisters, Josephine and Angelina. February 10th, 1945, Galante married Helen Maroli, by whom he had three children with. James, not to be confused with Jimmy Galante, former owner of the Dan's, uh, Danbury Thrashers. I don't know why anybody would confuse him of that, but... Right. And uh, they had Camille and Angela. For the last 20 years of his life, Carmine lived with Anne Aquavella. The couple had two children together as well. Uh, not to be mentioned, I guess. Right. He was the uncle to Bonanno crime family, Capo, Capo, James Carmine Galante. While in prison in 1931, doctors diagnosed Galante as having psychopathic personality. Oh, jeez. He's a schizo. Uh, Galante owned the Rosina Costume Company in Brooklyn. And he was associated with the Abco Vending Company of West New York. Really? Uh, West New York, New Jersey. Really? Abco, huh? Look at this guy. Mm, I mean... Are you spreads? Right. Age of 10, Galante was set to, sent to reform school due to his criminal activities. Uh, he soon formed a juvenile street gang on New York's Lower East Side. By the age of 15, he had dropped out of seventh grade. And as a teenager, he became a mafia associate during the Prohibition era, becoming a lead enforcer by the end of the decade. Damn. During this period, Galante also worked as a fish sorter and in an artificial flower shop. At an artificial flower shop. Why is a flower shop uh, working with fish? I don't know. December 12, 1925, the 15-year-old Galante pleaded guilty to assault charges. December 22nd, 1926, he was sentenced to at least two and a half years in state prison. Ooh, shit, hell of an assault. Right. Uh, 30th, uh, August, 1930, Galante was arrested for the moita of police officer Walter de Castilla. Oh, no. Uh, during a uh, payroll robbery. Oh, shit. However, Galante was never indicted. Hmm. Also, 1930, New York Police Department officer Joseph Minahan they caught Galante and other gang members attempting to hijack a truck in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. The ensuing gun battle, Galante wounded Minahan and a six-year-old bystander. Oh, jeez. Oh, and they both survived, though. 8th of February, year 1931. After pleading guilty to attempted robbery, Galante was sentenced to 12 and a half years in state prison. 1st of May, 1939. He was released from prison on parole. Uh, so he did eight years. Not even attempted murder or nothing, huh? Just attempted robbery. Okay. Eight years old. Uh, 1940, Galante was carrying out hits for Gito, Gito, for Vito Genovese, the official, <laughs> uh, for Vito Genovese, the official underboss of the Luciano crime family at this time. Right. Galante, uh, Galante had an underworld reputation for viciousness and was suspected by the NYPD of involvement in over 80 moides. Oh, I'm sure. Galante reportedly had a cold, dead-eyed stare with eyes that betrayed an utter indifference human, an indifference to human life. I mean, Scaring. the mob headers, do they count as serial killers? No. Why not? No. It's not serial. Of course it is. No. What do you mean? It's not serial killers like do it for the thrill and these guys are just doing it for business. Stay alive? Uh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he scared both law enforcement officers and other mafia members with this cold, dead-eyed stare as well. Oh. I don't want to mess with him. Ralph Salerno. 
former MIPD detective. He wasn't said Dan, that is Solano as a detective? Well. I wonder if he's related to the other guy. Maybe. I bet he is. You got to have somebody inside, right? Anyway, he once said, of all the gangsters that I've met personally, and I've met dozens in all my years, there were only two who, when I looked them straight in the eye, I decided I wouldn't want them to be really personally mad at me. Nice. Uh, Aniello de la Cruz was one, and then Carmine Galante is the other. They had bad eyes. I mean, they had the eyes of killers. You could see how frightening they were. The frigid glare of a killer. Damn, who's this Agnello Della Croce guy? Uh, did we do him? What family is he from? thought we did a Della Croce. Talked about him. He's a member. Gambino. Oh, he's coming. <laughs> he's a coming. Yeah, look at those eyes. He's not even looking at you. He ain't got no one to. I don't think cameras would take pictures of when he's looking at the camera. They're like, nope. <laughs> Mentor to John Gotti. That makes sense. 1943, Galante allegedly murdered Carlo Tresca, the publisher of an anti-fascist newspaper in New York. Genovese, living in exile in Italy, offered to kill Tresca as a favor to Italian Prime Minister Benito Mussolini. Genovese allegedly gave the murder contract to Galante. Wait, I thought that Genovese and Mussolini didn't get along. No, remember when he went back? He was oh. doing things for him? Right, 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 right. right. Uh, January 11, 1943, Galante allegedly shot and killed Tresca as he stepped outside his newspaper office in Manhattan and then got in a car and drove away. I'm sure he did. Although Galante was arrested as a suspect, no one was ever charged in the murder. Hmm. After that murder, he was sent back to prison on a parole violation. December 21st, 1944, he was released. Just in and out of prison, huh? Usually goes that way. 1953. He's only 34. Right. 1953. <laughs> 1953, boss Joseph Bonanno, he sent Galante to Montreal. He's like, you're on to Canada, baby. You're going to organize the family's drug business and rackets over there. Nice. He worked with Vincenzo Catroni of the Catroni crime family in the French Connection. Well, a bunch of Frenchmen, huh? I don't think Frenchmen and Italians got along very well, but I guess so. The Bonannos were importing a huge amount of heroin by ship into Montreal and then sent it into the United States. Right through... uh New York, Ohio, and Michigan right there, I bet. Mostly Michigan, huh? Quebec. Or Buffalo, I would assume. Yeah, Quebec Street. Police also estimated that Galante was collecting gambling profits in Montreal worth up to $50 million per year. Making that money. Damn. April 56, due to Galante's strong arm extortion tax tactics, the Canadian government deported him back to the United States. Get out of here, man. October 57, Bonanno and Galante, now a cons cons concierge, had a hotel meeting in Palermo, Sicily, on plans to import heroin into the United States. Oh, shit. Attendees included. We've all heard about this. Right. Lucky Luciano and other American mobsters with the Sicilian Mafia delegation led by Giuseppe Genco Russo. Oh. As part of the agreement, Sicilian mobsters would come to the U.S. to distribute the narcotics. Galante oh. brought many young men known as Zips from his family home of Casta la Mer del Golfo. Uh, to work as bodyguards, right. contract killers, and drug traffickers. Uh, so they got a bunch of... Uh, I bet you that pissed off. A lot of the local gangsters, though, that Sicilians are coming in and running their shit. I don't know. They love people from the old country. I guess. But What's his name? The old country don't love people from here. What's his name? Uh, the dude that Tony brought back. Right. 1958, after being <laughs> indicted on drug conspiracy charges, Galante went into hiding. June 3rd, 1959, New Jersey State Police officers arrested Galante after stopping his car. Oh, he didn't go in a very good hiding. Right. They stopped him on Garden State Parkway, close to New York City. Federal agents had recently discovered that Galante was hiding in a house on Pelican Island off the Jersey Shore. After posting $100,000 bail, he's released. <laughs> All that just to be so stupid. 18th of May, 1960, Galante was indicted on a second set of narcotics charges. He surrendered. All right, well, his first narcotics trial tri uh, started on November 21st, 1960. One of his co-defendants was William ben ben Bent Vena, a Gambino-made man who was murdered by Henry Hill's associates, James Burke and Thomas D. Simone. Oh, don't say that. From the beginning, the first trial was characterized by jurors and alternates dropping out and coercive courtroom displays by the defendants. Wow. wow. <laughs> May 15th, 1961, the judge declared a mistrial. I bet they did. The jury foreman fell down some stairs in an abandoned building in the middle of the night and was unable to continue the trial due to injury. Oh, my. 
You just fell down an abandoned stairs. And, and what are you doing in an abandoned building, dude? <laughs> in the middle of the night. In the middle of the night. Was in sent- the middle of the oh, night. Oh, my. Galante was sentenced to 20 days in jail for contempt of court, though. No. Nope. July 10th, 1962, after being convicted in his they second narcotics narc- trial. Right. Uh, well, he was convicted in his second narcotics trial, and he was sentenced to 20 years in federal prison Ooh-wee. for that one, though. Ooh, wee. January 1974. He gets to be released from prison on parole. Following his release from prison, Galante allegedly ordered the bombing <laughs> of the doors to the private mausoleum of his enemy, Frank Estella. Right, remember in that. St. Michael Cemetery, who had died in 1973. February 23rd, year 1974. At a meeting at the Americana Hotel in Manhattan, the commission named Philip Rusty Rostelli as the old boss. When Rostelli was sent to prison in 1976, Galante seized control of the Bananos as an unofficial acting boss. He said, I'll take this. Thank you very much. I paid my damn mm-hmm. dime. Uh, during the late 70s, Galante allegedly organized the murders of at least eight members of the Gambino family, with whom he had an intense rivalry in order to take over a massive drug trafficking operation. March 3, 1978, Galante's parole was revoked by the United States Parole Commission for allegedly associating with other Bonanno mobsters. Well, of course. And he was sent back to prison. However, February 27, 1979, a judge ruled that the government had illegally revoked Galante's parole and then ordered his immediate release. Oh, Damn. look at that shit. Well, not good for him. Not that picture. <laughs> oh, man. The New York crime families were alarmed at Galante's brazen attempt to take over the narcotics market. Who the fuck is this guy? Right. Genovese crime family boss, Frank Thierry. He began contacting Costa Nostra leaders to build a consensus for Galante's moida, even obtaining approval from the retired Joe Bonanno. 1979, they received a boost when the official boss, Ristelli, sought commission approval to kill Galante. Joseph Messino, a banana soldier loyal to Ristelli, relayed the request to the commission, which swiftly approved it. They're like, yeah, we got to get this guy out of here. They're just waiting for him to do it. Right. Come on, Ristelli, where's where this word at? We need, right, we need some, it's your guys' family, do you right. guys want to do it or what? July 12, 1979, Galante was killed just mm-hmm. as he finished eating lunch on an open patio at Joe and Mary's Italian American restaurant. At least they let him have his last meal. All right. I bet they waited for he was when he was done. That's that cocksucker eat. Right. <laughs> He was dining with Leonard or Leonard Coppola, a Bonanno Capo and staunch Galante loyalist and restaurant owner co- and uh, cousin Giuseppe Tirano, a Bonanno soldier. Also sitting at the table were Galante's Sicilian bodyguards, a Baldassare Amato and Cesar Bonventre. Well, so much for bodyguards. Right, right, right. 2.45 p.m., three ski masked men entered the restaurant, walked into the patio, opened fire with shotguns and handguns. Jeez. Galante, Tirano, Coppola? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Galante, <laughs> Toronto, Coppola were moited instantly. A picture, damn, they didn't even mean to take down those two guys. No, they didn't give a shit. They're all members of the family. Right. A picture of the murdered Galante showed a cigar still in his mouth. Amato and Bonventre, who had done nothing to protect Galante, were left unharmed. They probably set it up. The gunmen then ran out of the restaurant. They left those guys. Right, they had to have because if they killed the other dudes. Mm-mm-mm. Right in the eye. Right in the eye, he got his ass. Gone. Mm. Uh, the Roman Catholic Archdiocese of New York refused to allow a funeral mass for Galante due to his notor- notoriety. He was buried at St. John Cemetery in Middle Village, Queens. 1984, Bonventre was found murdered in a New Jersey warehouse, allegedly to guarantee his silence in the Galante murder. See? Yeah. Oh, yeah. January 13, 1987, Anthony Indelicato was sentenced to 40 years in prison as a defendant in the commission trial for the Galante, Coppola, and Toronto murders. Oh, shit. He is depicted in the first episode of the UK History TV channel, yesterday's documentary series, Mafia's Greatest Hits. Oh, shit. Look at the UK yeah, doing uh, American history. Right. <laughs> right. Jeez. All right. So that was old Galante, huh? Good for him. Galante. All right. Let's take a look at old the old man, Anthony Spiro. He was uh he rose to the position of concierge and acting boss of the Banano crime family. He did. Spiro was a large man with dark hair, a dark complexion, was good looking in a rough way, said Philip Carlo. <laughs> Whoever that is. All right. He was fair, smart, and exceedingly well-versed in the ways of the street. All right. According to the testimony of boss turned informant Joe Messino, Anthony Spiro was inducted into the Bonanno oh. crime family by Carmine Galante on the 14th of June, 1977. Thanks for ruining next week's episode of Hansel. Right. <laughs> so the ceremony was held in the Queen's Bar, in a Queen's Bar. Uh, among those inducted were Messino, Joseph Chile Jr., and Peter Monteleone. 
And several others. <laughs> and others. <laughs> and others. Uh, a reserved and low-profile man, Spiro's hobby was a bre- was breeding racing pigeons yeah. in coops on the roof of a Bensonhurst building. What the fuck's a racing pigeon? Well, you're, clearly, that's exactly how it sounds. Oh, you're racing. Uh, to avoid electronic surveillance from law enforcement, Spiro sometimes held crew meetings on the same rooftop. <laughs> Plus, you got them all chirping around. It's right. hard to pick up cam- or like mics. Mm-hmm. Sparrow was married with two daughters, Jill and Diana, and owned a home in Staten Island. Good for you, Staten Island. All right. One of Sparrow's Shit. most lucrative enterprises was selling stolen fireworks. Wow, hey. really? He owned a huge warehouses. Uh, he owned huge warehouses of fireworks and made close to five million a year selling them. Holy Damn. shit, dude! Well, I mean, <clears throat> pretty much fireworks are illegal everywhere right now. Yeah, it's true. Every Fourth of July. Spiro would stage a fireworks display on the Bath Avenue in Bath Beach, Brooklyn. That allegedly cost him several hundred thousand dollars. For these parties, Spiro also supplied food that was said to be enough to feed all of Bensonhurst, Brooklyn. Uh, I guarantee everybody in Bath Beach, Brooklyn, and Bensonhurst knew that he was oh, a piece of shit crime boss. You ain't getting But they all fucking love that 4th of July mm-hmm. celebration. Mm-hmm. Though, didn't Spiro was a close associate of Colombo crime family capo, Gregory Scarpa. All right, Scarpa. And also Lucchese crime family capo and future underboss, Anthony Castle. All right. Following the death of Alphonse in, in Delicato and the indictment of his son, Anthony, Bonanno mobster Thomas Pittura became close to Sparrow. He's like, come on, come close to me, buddy. Okay. <laughs> Sparrow later in- inducted Patera into the Bonanno crime family and an initiation ceremony at the House of Bonanno. <laughs> House of Bonanno. <laughs> <laughs> the House of Bonanno capo, Frank Lino. All right. Did 19- you do Frank Lino? Uh, uh, no. Not yet. Well, he's a capo, so we've only done bosses so far. Oh, okay. uh, 1990, Sparrow ordered the murder of Louis Tuzio, a Bonanno associate who had botched a mob killing. Oh, no. Never want to botch a mob killing. Mm-mm. An uh, ambitious gangster, Tuzio had offended Sparrow by demanding to become a made man. Ooh, he dem- you can't do that. And you can't do that either. No. Uh, January 1990, Tuzio was found dead in his car in Brooklyn with a bullet wound in the back of his head. Ooh. 1990, Sparrow ordered the murder of Vincent Bickelman, a burglar from New York. Or a burglar. A burglar. The Brooklyn burglar. August 1991, Bickelman had broken into the home of Sparrow's daughter, Jill, oh. stolen her jewelry in a fur coat. What do you I mean, think he was going to get away with that well, shit? I'm sure he didn't know it was his daughter. Uh, September 15, 1991, Bickelman's body with six bullet wounds was discovered near his apartment in Bath Beach. Mm. Uh, Bickleman was allegedly murdered by Bonanno associate Paul Gulino, an ambitious young mobster who ran the Bath Avenue crew. He's like, I'll get him, I'll get him for you. Right. 1993, Spiro ordered Gulino. Oh, jeez. Oh, damn. He ordered Gulino's murder in July of that year during an argument with Spiro at the Bath Beach Social Club. Gulino made physical contacts with the capo. Oh, he can't do that. A breach of Costa Nostra protocol. He can't do that. Oh, Two geez. weeks later. His parents discovered him shot to death in their kitchen. <sighs> in their kitchen? Wow. 24th of January, year 1994. Spiro was indicted on federal racketeering charges of extortion and moita. The indictment stated that Spiro controlled a business that used extortion to place joker poker, gambling machines in bars, social clubs, and other establishments around the old city. Spiro was also charged in the 1991 <laughs> moita of Mark Goldberg, a rival in the illegal gambling business. Goldberg, oh, we killed a Jew. You can't do that. Right. April 1995, Spiro was acquitted of the Goldberg moita. Oh, no. But he was convicted of extortion. Eh, probably the more. <laughs> right. Uh, no. How do he you... was. Right. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sentence two years, prison. 1997, oh, Spiro, they let him fly. He was released, right? <laughs> <laughs> May 30th, 1999, Spiro was indicted on federal racketeering yeah. charges that included loan sharking and the Tuzio, Bickerman, and Julino murders from the 90s. Uh, Spiro completed not guilty on all accounts. He was released from jail and confined to a Staten Island house wearing an electronic ankle bracelet. Oh, that works. Assistant U.S. Attorney James Walden of the Eastern District of New York was the lead prosecutor in the case. Hmm. During the trial, one of the witnesses that testified against Sparrow was Alphonse Darko, Darko, oh, yeah. the former underboss of the Lucchese crime family. Uh-huh. So what's this guy got going on? Oh, Darko, recounted a 1991 conversation in which Sparrow stated that family members of mob informants, including children, should be moited in retaliation. Oh, jeez. Well, you mean the kids, huh? April 5th, 2001, Sparrow was convicted of three moitas and other racketeering charges. April 26th, year 20, 2002. <laughs> April, 20, April 16th, 2002, Spiro was sentenced to life in prison. His lawyer requested leniency due to Spiro's poor health, which we seek always. Right. But the judge is like, no. September 29th, year 2008, Spiro, dead, age 79, Federal Correctional Complex in Butner, North Carolina. 
Sparrow's body was interred at the Cemetery of the Resurrection in Staten Island. New York. All right. Well, that makes way for... Uh, let's get <laughs> Wow. That worked out. Mm, I guess. Uh, oh, jeez. That makes way for... Oh, Mr. Joseph Messino to become head boss, which will have his story next week because his is legitimately going to be probably a good forty-five minutes at least. Uh, he's got a good <laughs> he's got a good story, so we'll save that one for next week for he'll be by himself. Yeah, and then uh, yeah, good stuff here. Finally, stories that aren't repeating themselves, though, when we get to other bosses, you know? All of that, all of the um, Genovese crime family one was just repeat of everything we heard a hundred times. Um, yeah, we'll see you then. In the meantime, go check out our YouTube, which we are officially unbanned if you're looking to this, uh, listen to this on the day this comes out. Yay. Officially a day late, so... Uh, well, there's actually going to be about five videos dropping uh, within the next day, so we've got to catch up on our uh, week band. But, yeah, go subscribe to uh, YouTube at Bang Dang Network. And if you're listening on the podcast, give us a review and maybe comment or two, and we'll be back next week for more Outlaws and Gunslingers Mafia. Mafia. Where the mouth of Michigan is with. Bang Dang.